Welcome back. I see you've somehow managed to survive the brutal onslaught of Sega's graveyard from the previous video. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'd advise you to go watch that one first to get the full picture. Or not, it's your choice. Now, you'll be happy to hear that it's pretty much more of the same over here. The grass is definitely not greener on this side, that's for sure. But I hope you've mentally prepared yourself, as we're starting off with a doozy. And the award for the most creative main goes to... It's the biggest piece of dog shit. Well, I thought it sounded cool. The uninspiring name aside, Bug was a platform game first released in 1995 for the Sega Saturn. It would be one of the first platformer games to incorporate 3D environments and restrict players' movements to a track. The game, believe it or not, centered around a bug called Bug, who was a green bug and Hollywood actor who wanted to gain more clout by defeating the vicious queen, Cadavera. Bug would work his way through multiple worlds, which made up Bug Island. Are you guys sick of hearing me say bug yet? Well, <laughs> there's plenty more, don't worry. These worlds were filled with enemy bugs, ranging from insects to mollusks to arachnids, with each ending in a boss fight. Now while bug didn't catch the eye of the general public, it did receive generally positive reviews. A sequel titled Bug 2, get it? Because it's the, the second game? You don't say! Yeah, they need to work on their titles. The sequel would feature much of the same as its predecessor, but would suffer from poor camera settings, resulting in very frustrating gameplay. Following Bug 2, Sega would squish him, with no chance of a revival. Now what better way to follow up a game series about a bug, than with the game series about a toy soldier? Sega was certainly working overtime in the creative department with these games. Now, while Bug was looking to take out royalty in the form of Queen Cadavera, Sir Tongara, the protagonist of Clockwork Knight, wanted nothing more than to win the heart of royalty due to his love for the fairy princess, Chelsea. Being a side-scrolling platformer in the same vein as the Mario and Sonic series, the game would separate itself from the bunch by using 2D sprites on top of fully 3D levels and bosses. Its short length and extremely easy difficulty were criticised, however, and the game never really took off as a result. Even so, just six months later, a sequel would be released titled Clockwork Knight 2, which just as quickly picked up on the cliffhanger left by its predecessor. Clockwork Knight 2 would fare much better than the original, and would go on to garner praise for its much greater replay value, graphics, and the endless number of secrets. Following this entry, the franchise would see a number of planned sequels, none of which made it past the beta stage unfortunately. Because of this, it seems as though Sega has lost hope in this franchise as well. Now we'll take a quick detour back in time for this one, which I seemingly missed in my first part. Thunderblade has little to do with thunder or blades, and instead has a lot to do with decimating enemy tanks, helicopters, and structures from inside a helicopter with your chain gun and missiles. The game was heavily inspired by the 1983 film Blue Thunder, which is where its name is derived from. The game started as your standard stand-up arcade cabinet, but was later updated to a helicopter-shaped sit-down model that would move in tandem with the joystick. A sequel titled Super Thunderblade would release a year later as a launch title for the Sega Genesis, and featured a lot of the same as its predecessor. Despite the appeal of the games, there has not been a new iteration outside of a few re-releases of Super Thunderblade, and therefore we can slot it once again into the dead tier. Now what did I tell you? This part of the video isn't any better, and to prove that, let me introduce you to Beyond Oasis, one of the best action-adventure games of its time. The player took control of good old Prince Ali, who after finding a buried gold armlet, could use it to summon four spirits. Being that it's an action-adventure game, it shares elements similar to games such as The Legend of Zelda, where Prince Ali can pick up items, restore health, mana, and gain numerous special weapons. The game received incredibly positive reviews, leading to a sequel, or should I say a prequel, titled The Legend of Oasis in 1996. Yeah, I think they were taking its similarities to The Legend of Zelda a bit too literally with that title. The gameplay, while still involving the collecting of elemental spirits, now took place in real time, and each weapon came with its own set of special attacks that played out in fighting game styles. The prequel was positively received as well, but I'm guessing sales must have been lacking, as this would be the last time we saw anything to do with the Oasis series. Following the immense success of Sega's first 3D fighter, Virtua Fighter, they looked to return to the genre with the release of Fighting Vipers. The game incorporated the same engine as Virtua Fighter 2, which would instead feature enclosed arenas and its own unique armor mechanic. This armor would slowly be broken upon taking damage, leaving opponents susceptible to heavier hits that dealt more damage. Fighting Vipers, unlike the many fighting games prior, featured more freedom styles of martial arts in a US setting to cater more towards a western player base, and to a certain degree this proved to be extremely effective, as the game would go on to become the most popular arcade game at the time. This would lead to its very own sequel in Fighting Vipers 2, which would release just three years later in arcades. While the game went on to become a hit in arcades in Japan, the game would never make it to the US. 
even though it was initially slated for a US release. The original Fighting Vipers would get a re-release in late 2012 on the PlayStation Network, but outside of that, this makes up another of Sega's lost franchises. Oh, would you look at that? We've stumbled across one of the best rail shooters ever, Panzer Dragoon. Get this. In this game, you play as a hunter who rides his own dragon as he blasts his way through waves of different enemies. With six levels each being connected through cutscenes, the game separated itself with its 3D field of view in which enemies could appear from all sides. Yes, that means even behind you. It made gameplay extremely exciting, and the fact that you were riding a goddamn dragon just made it that much cooler. While the game garnered very positive reviews, the game suffered from low sales, most likely because it was stuck on the Sega Saturn, which was getting beaten down by the original PlayStation at the time. Even so, Pan Panzer Dragoon would fight for its life and actually managed to spawn its own series of games. In total, the Panzer Dragoon series has released 6 games, 5 of which have been released between 1995 and 2002. After an extremely long wait, the original game would receive a remake, which was released in 2020 for the Nintendo Switch. Outside of this respective franchise, former development staff have worked on multiple spiritual successes, such as Rez in 2001 and Crimson Dragon in 2013, giving hope to the possibility of a series revival in some regards. Despite its recent remake, I believe we'd be incredibly unlikely to see a new game anytime soon, but for now, I think it can slot into live support. Following on from Panzer Dragoon, Sega would return to the RPG genre with the release of Mysteria The Realms of Lore in 1995, also for the Sega Saturn. While this game would incorporate your typical turn-based combat on grid-based battlefields, it would differentiate itself by having rather unique objectives alongside eliminating enemies. These could range from reaching a certain destination or avoiding contact with enemies entirely. The formation of your party was also done in a non-linear format, and the story would actually adjust itself depending on the newest character addition to that party. While it was positive positively received in Japan. Many critics believed it would not fare well in the West, as there was far too little story to drive players forward, and certain aspects became far too tedious, especially for an audience that at the time had very little exposure to the genre as a whole. These concerns are probably the reason why the game's sequel titled Rig Lord Saga 2 never made its way out of Japan. Regardless, Rig Lord 2 would mark the final entry in this franchise, and I'm starting to think I should have made this tier even larger. So among the galaxy's greatest heroes, we've got Iron Man, Batman, Superman, and Vector Man. Wait, you, you don't know about Vector Man? Well settle in, and let me tell you the story of the greatest man of them all. Vector Man was the titular character of his own 2D action platformer, in which he could be seen jumping, running, and blasting enemies with projectile attacks. Similar in a sense to Mega Man. Dang, I guess it was just customary back then to put man behind everything. Regardless, he would also be given the special ability to transform into different forms, such as a helicopter or other vehicles. These would give him certain abilities tied to that transformation. Vector Man was so strong, he transformed himself into stellar reviews, and stories of his righteous nature and courage as he saved the Earth were spread across the galaxy, resulting in over 500,000 people picking up a copy of his games. Due to popular demand, he would return only a year later in Vector Man 2, where he did much of the same. Despite him once again saving the day, he would soon vanish, never to be seen again. Rumors surfaced about him returning in a third installment, and he even came back to tease his fans at E3 2003, but was later cancelled for being too green, and he hasn't been back since. He doesn't deserve it, but Vector Man is unfortunately a dead man. So Sega had incorporated their Virtua 3D style into fighting games, then into shooters, so of course the next logical step would be to incorporate this style into sports games, and that's exactly what they did with the release of Virtua Striker. As was the case with both Virtua Fighter and Virtua Cop, Virtua Striker would get its namesake by incorporating the unique 3D polygonal computer graphics that had shot both the previous series to start in, and in classic Sega fashion, they would advertise this new series as the first three-dimensional computer graphics soccer game. I'm starting to think Sega may have a kink for being the first to do things. Regardless, the series would see four mainline entries, released consistently throughout the years, from 1994 with the original to 2006 with Virtua Striker 4. Honestly, for the most part, the game still seems to hold up somewhat to this day. Virtua Striker 4 remains the last entry, and it stayed that way for over 15 years. By this point, had it been a few years since Sega's last beat em up franchise, Sega would return to the genre with the release of Die Hard Arcade in 1996. This game would also be the first beat em up to use texture mapped 3D polygon graphics. Now, I know what you're thinking, well, that can't be right. This game isn't called Virtua Beta or something similar. And honestly, I'm surprised Sega didn't continue with that naming convention. But fancy 3D polygon graphics weren't all that this new beat em up had to offer. Die Hard also included a more sophisticated moveset, quick time events, and the ability to combine items to make more power 
powerful weapons. The violence, while being dramatic and over the top, wasn't particularly gory, and instead was hyped up to play more of a comedic role. A sequel known as Dynamite Cop would release two years later and feature similar gameplay to its predecessor. Its main character, Delinga, would actually make a cameo appearance in The House of the Dead 2. Outside of that though, the Dynamite and Decker franchise has been lost to the wayside, never to appear again. Sega was really firing on all cylinders during this period, and this next series continued to prove that. Let me introduce you to Dragon Force, a relatively unknown real-time strategy game that was initially released in 1996 for the Sega Saturn. The game was quite unique in that it had players assume the role of one of the game's eight rulers. These rulers were all vying for control of Legendra, and to help them had an army of up to 100 soldiers. Armies would travel between towns and castles via fixed routes on an overhead map, and when two armies collided on the map, a battle would ensue. This is where the gameplay really took on a life of its own. These battles were played out in real time, and featured the sprites of all your soldiers, meaning that there could be up to 200 soldiers fighting on screen at any one time. Decisions had to be made on the fly, and this led to some incredibly engaging and chaotic fun. The game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its melding of war simulation along with its story-driven RPG genres, and is often regarded as one of the Saturn's best games. The game would also sell decently well, shipping over 400,000 copies worldwide. This led to the creation of a sequel, fittingly titled Dragon Force 2, just two years after the original. Unfortunately, this game would remain a Japanese exclusive release, and the series as a whole has not received another entry since. It really is a shame that so many of these old Sega classics have seemingly been left out to rot in the ever-growing graveyard that is Sega's library. Sega's next endeavour would be the Knights franchise. The first game in the series, Knights into Dreams, was a 1996 action game that followed teenagers Elliot Edwards and Clarice Sinclair as they entered the Dreamworld Nightopia. It was here that they would meet the exiled Nightmare and Knights and start their journey to stop the evil ruler Wiseman from destroying Nightopia and with it, the real world. Players would take control of knights as they flew through Elliot and Clarice's dreams, while collecting enough energy to, to defeat Wiseman. Each of these levels came with a time limit, and while the controls certainly took some time to get used to, there was no better feeling once mastered than to watch as you strung together multiple loops and orbs in a fluid fashion. I remember thinking for a game called Knights, why were all the levels played during what appeared to be daytime? But ignoring the thoughts of a dumb little kid who could barely manage to do anything on this game back in the 2000s, the game would receive acclaim for its graphics, gameplay, soundtrack, and unique atmosphere. It is often credited as one of the greatest games of all time, and would go on to become the best-selling game on the Saturn in 1996. You'd expect following this kind of response that a sequel would be in development the next day, but unfortunately for fans, they'd have to wait almost a decade before the long-awaited sequel, Knights Journey of Dreams, would release in 2007 for the Nintendo Wii. The sequel would incorporate a lot from its predecessor, and in similar fashion had Knights flying through the dreams of the two children while gathering keys to progress. This iteration would go on to receive criticism due to its controls, camera and aesthetics, but despite this mixed reception, series creator Takashi Lizuka would state that he was still interested in developing a third installment. With no new updates in the following years, many considered the franchise to have died off, but in 2019, Sega would file the trademark for Knight's Dream Wheel. This raised a few eyebrows, with many thinking a new game would be coming out soon. Unfortunately, in June of 2021, it was revealed that this was merely a slot machine at a resort and casino. I think the interest is still there though, and while the likelihood of a new entry is extremely low, it can still survive in the zombie tier. Now hear me out, imagine this, it's 1996, and there's a tactical RPG game, so far so good right? But this game also works as a dating sim, with storytelling reminiscent of visual novels. Doesn't that sound like fun? Wait, wh why are you leaving? To say the Sakura Wars franchise was ambitious would be an understatement, especially for the time period. Sure, there were plenty of popular tactical RPGs, and while not hugely popular, visual novels definitely had their own fanbase. But the thought of mixing these genres as well as implementing dating sim mechanics was unheard of. It was so out there that Sega had to term it a dramatic adventure, as there really wasn't anything like it to compare it to. The gameplay, which was somewhat inspired by Fire Emblem, was split between adventure-style segments where players could explore environments and interact with cast members, and battle sections where your choices from the adventure sections would actually have an effect. It was also during these adventure sections that players could pursue romances with the female cast, which by these days standards doesn't seem too strange when you think of games like Fire Emblem or the Persona series. Now, it's understandable for outsiders to think that the game may not perform well, but even a few staff members were skeptical that the game would even be commercially successful. Well, they were most likely roasted the following week, as the original Sakura Wars would outsell all expectations. 
The game received positive reviews and the series has now expanded to include six mainline games and plenty of spin-offs. The series has also branched into the anime and film industry, where it's had multiple series produced for it. Despite the success, the series did actually die out at one point, following the release of Sakura Wars So Long My Love in 2005. But due to the positive fan response at Sega's FES convention, the series was renewed with its latest entry in 2019. This entry in particular was met with very average reviews though, so while it had fun interactions between its characters, I'm not too sure we'll see another entry, at least not for a while. If Sega's flagship fighter is Virtua Fighter, and their flagship platform is Sonic the Hedgehog, then their flagship horror series would without a doubt be the House of the Dead. What started off as a horror themed light gun shooter quickly spawned into a series of games that has continued to this very day. The original House of Dead, which had been released back in 1996, followed agents Thomas Rogan and G in their attempts to stop the disillusioned Dr. Kurian and his army of undead from overrunning the unsuspecting populace. Being that the game was a rail shooter, players were tasked with shooting oncoming zombies. It wasn't all linear however, as there were certain choices players could make that would affect the direction of the gameplay. This game in particular alongside Resident Evil is often credited for popularizing zombie video games, as well as bringing zombies back into the limelight, leading to a renewed interest in zombie films and pop culture going into the 2000s. The series would expand to include four further sequels, as well as a remake that was recently released in 2022. Furthermore, during an interview with Sega in 2019, series director Takashi Oda stated that he wanted to produce three more games for the series, essentially alluding to the continuation of this franchise. Taking this into account, I'm willing to drop this series into the mainstays, and I'm aware that there was a somewhat long drought period, but with the renewed interest and recent entries, I think has a good chance of staying on track for now. Now if you're a fan of mechs, then you're gonna love this next franchise. I'm talking about Virtual On Cyber Troopers, a 3D fighting game where players battled in massive mechs while zooming around large open-ended arenas. Players had a choice of multiple Virtua Roids, each with their own unique selection of weapons. I always loved Raiden and his shoulder-mounted laser cannons. Despite this, the series never got its own direct sequel. Now you may be wondering, well why is it included in this video then? Well that's because the game did end up with its own spiritual successor, but not in the way you'd think. This spiritual successor would be in the form of a certain magical virtual on, which combined the gameplay of the 3D fighter with the characters and story of a certain magical index, a popular light novel series that has had its own fair share of spin-off games. It just so happens that one of them incorporated elements from Cyber Troopers. Even with this though, I'm going to have to say that this franchise is most likely a dead one. In what may be the best box art for a video game ever, we have Sega Bass Fishing. Honestly, you could have no text on this cover, and I'd know exactly what I was in for. Uh. What started as an arcade game quickly got ported over to systems like the Dreamcast, Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii. The goal of bass fishing surprisingly has nothing to do with bass, at least not specifically. The player was tasked with catching a certain weight of fish within a time limit to progress. Despite its simplicity, the arcade version of the game actually got listed as the second most popular arcade game of the month. Bass fishing was such a huge hit that a further two games were released. In 2012, an on-rails FPS crossover titled Sega Bass Fishing of the Dead was reported to be in development for Nintendo's Wii U and 3DS. But in what may be one of the most disappointing reveals ever, it was all just an April Fool's joke. I have yet to recover from that. I mean, who wouldn't want to play a game like this? Sega Bass Fishing of the Dead? More like Sega Bass Fishing in the Dead, Tia. <laughs> I think I'm starting to lose it, guys. Now Sega's next franchise, Spike Out, would return to the beat-em-up style in the same vein as Streets of Rage. The difference this time was that Spike Out ushered the beat-em-up genre into the 3D landscape. The arcade game would become the third most successful game of the month and spawn its own set of sequels. The first was Spike Out Final, which was released a year later in 1999. Slash Out would switch things up, now taking place in a medieval fantasy setting and act as a slasher map instead. Spiker's Battle would add a versus fighting element when it was released in 2001, and the final game in the franchise, Spike Out Battle Street, was released exclusively for the Xbox back in 2005. That's right, Xbox used to get their very own exclusives. Oh, how times have changed. Unfortunately, if there's one thing that hasn't changed, it's the overwhelming number of dead Sega franchises, with this being one of them. Choo Choo Rocket. Now with a name like that, I honestly have no idea what to expect. 
but in reality, this is just a series of fun action puzzle games that could be played online with friends. The main goal for this game was to place arrows on a board that would lead mice into escape rockets while avoiding cats. The game would feature both single player modes as well as a multiplayer mode, where players could battle it out to see who could collect the most mice. Due to its chaotic nature and addictive multiplayer, the game would go on to become a commercial and critical success. It had made such a large splash that other games like Sega Superstars and Billy Hatcher and The Giant Egg had mini games based on Choo Choo Rocket included in them. Now, Alongside the many ports of the original, the series would actually get a sequel 20 years later with Choo Choo Rocket Universe in 2019. Despite this recent release though, I can't in good faith say that this game is any higher than a zombie tier at the moment. Hey hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! Now just based on the name of this next franchise, I'm sure you could guess the genre and general gist of what it had you doing. Wait a minute! Crazy Taxi was a series of racing games that had players try and accumulate as much money as possible by delivering passengers in a speedy fashion to their destinations. The crazy aspect comes into play when you realise you can undertake crazy stunts to rack up extra tips. The franchise has been recognised for its innovative gameplay design, which was easy to learn but incredibly hard to master. It was also one of the pioneering games to introduce in-game advertising. The original, which was released back in 1999, was so popular that it got its own port to the Dreamcast, which would go on to sell over 1 million copies. After witnessing this, there was no looking back, as the series would expand to include a further 6 games ending with Crazy Taxi Tycoon, which was released for iOS and Android in 2017. The game would get delisted from both app stores in April of 2020, with the servers going offline shortly after. Now there may have been rumours circling in recent years regarding big budget reboots of some of their older IPs. It just so happens that Crazy Taxi is one of those names that has been mentioned. Of course, these are all speculations for now, but it wouldn't hurt to throw Crazy Taxi into the live support tier because of them. Here we have one of the few games that was released only in the West and never in Japan. Toy Commander was an action game released in 1999 for the Dreamcast. You take control of an army of washed up toys, on a mission led by Huggy Bear to destroy the new army themed toys that Andy the child got for Christmas. The game incorporates its environment into its gameplay, and a lot of the levels involve missions that take advantage of certain situations that would only happen in that specific location. It's honestly quite cool. The game would garner praise for its subtle but spectacular visuals, and somewhat challenging gameplay. While no direct sequel would release, some may state that Toy Racer, which was released a year later in Europe for the Dreamcast, acts as the game's sequel. Even so, the developer of these games, no cliche, would unfortunately close down in 2001, essentially cancelling any plans for future entries into the series. New toys, old toys, I guess none of that matters in the dead tier. Now have you ever wanted to race on a horse without actually needing to get on a horse? Well look no further than Derby Owners Club, the next franchise on this list. Now I've never heard of this series before researching this video, but from the looks of it, it does look pretty intriguing. Released back in 1999, it had players actually create their very own horse. Players could then train these horses using 10 different exercises before giving them a meal. They would then race on these horses and be given a virtual prize money based on how well the horse had performed during the race. This particular arcade game actually changed the Japanese arcade market. While it charged slightly more, it allowed for longer periods of playtime, which was a new concept for the time. This success would extend over to the American arcades as well. Even so, the cabinet was deemed too expensive, and the game did not do enough to entice casual players to have a go. Multiple updates were issued for the game, as well as a sequel in 2008 called Derby Owners Club Feel the Rush. Most recently, the franchise received an iOS and Android version in 2012. This was later shut down in 2019 though. Taking all of this into account, I don't see this franchise making a return, and unfortunately has to go into the dead tier. We've seen plenty of tactical RPGs from Sega, but how about one from Atlas? Well luckily for us, Atlas would have a crack at the genre when they released Grow Lancer in 1999. The series as a whole grew rapidly, with Careersoft the developers pumping out 8 different iterations of the series within its 12 year lifespan. Unfortunately, the series never truly broke out of its niche shell, and as a result, no new installment has been seen since Grow Lancer 6, Precarious World, which was released back in 2007. The series would see future remakes of the original, but this too was released decades ago in 2009. And while not technically a Sega franchise, due to them now owning Atlas, it must join the rest in the dead tier. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't see you there. Let's just rock into some Samba de Amigo. If you couldn't tell, Samba de Amigo is a rhythm game that was first released in arcades in 1999. As is the case with many arcade games, players actually got to use controllers shaped like maracas in this game to match a series of patterns that were displayed on screen. The music in this game is the bomb, and is primarily made up of popular Latin music songs, rather than your traditional samba music. The game was incredibly fun and wacky, and it thrived because of this. 
After becoming the highest grossing arcade game of 2000 in Japan, it would receive multiple ports first to the Dreamcast in 2000, as well as the Wii in 2007. Sega would also release a spiritual successor named Shakato Tambourine the very same year, which pretty much played the exact same as Samba de Mugol, but instead of maracas? That's right, you guessed it. This game was played with a controller shaped like a tambourine. Well. No shit. Now apart from the ports of the original game, there was an incredibly long wait time before we would see the series make a return. For many this game seemed like a one hit wonder, but Sega, seemingly out of nowhere, would drop a sequel revealed during a Nintendo Direct on February 8th, 2023. This iteration will mimic the gameplay of the original by using the Switch Joy-Cons to mimic gestures, but will feature more variety in terms of its musical genres. So for now, I guess this series can be placed up into the it exists tier, although it's more than likely going to remain dormant following this latest release. So does anyone actually remember the microphone attachment for the Dreamcast? Alright, so for the 13 of you that do, do you remember any games that actually used it? No? Yeah, me either. Well that was before this video, and in particular Seaman, which was a virtual pet video game and one of the few to actually make use of the microphone attachment. Now where to start with this game, it's, uh, it's certainly unique. The game has players taking care of Seaman, the gimmick being that everything happens in real time. Essentially you have to check on him daily in fear of him dying. The Seaman would also throw insults to the player and ask certain questions which prompts the player to use the microphone attachment. So you don't think the internet should be censored, is that right? Yes. Well, good for you. The game garnered praise for its dark humour, unique gameplay and bizarre aesthetics. It even developed its own cult following, resulting in a sequel being developed called Seaman 2 for the PlayStation 2 in 2007. Seaman 2 would have players transcend to God status, where they could now alter the environments and give things to the island's inhabitants. The poor sales of the sequel most likely killed the series though, either that or it was just getting too weird and edgy. It seems as though Sega forgot these games worked in real time, because they have left Seaman to die for decades now. I think we've established this now, but Sega certainly wasn't shy when it came to ambitious titles, and the Shenmue series is a testament to that. Shenmue, which was released all the way back in 1999, was an action-adventure game that consisted of large 3D open-world environments, interspersed with brawler battles and quick-time events. It combined elements of role-playing, life simulation, and social simulation games, with its very own day and night cycle, various weather effects, NPCs that followed specific daily routines, and interactive activities like arcades and vending machines. All of these things culminated in a production and advertising cost of 50 to 7 million US dollars, making it the most expensive video game ever developed at the time. It's almost as impressive as it is insane for a game that's over 20 years old. Regardless, this incredible effort wouldn't go unnoticed, with many praising the game for its graphics, soundtrack, ambition, and realism. The game would sell over 1.2 million copies, but due to the mind-boggling production cost, it was actually deemed a commercial failure. Despite this, Shenmue 2 would release just two years later. Following Shenmue 2, though, this series would enter one of the worst development hells a series could experience. 2004 saw the announcement of a spin-off MMORPG titled Shenmue Online, which never saw an official release. 2010 saw Shenmue City launched in Japan only to be shut down a year later, but the prospect of a new original entry still eluded fans. During this disastrous thought, Yu Suzuki, the series director, who had left Sega following the release of Shenmue 2, would start a Kickstarter campaign in hopes of raising enough money to work on a third installment into the franchise. This Kickstarter was met with incredible support, becoming the fastest campaign to raise 2 million in under 7 hours, only to end the following month after raising a whopping 6 million. Suzuki would work on Shenmue 3 almost independently, and within 4 years the game would be unveiled and released in 2019. The game which remained faithful to its predecessor was met with mixed reception, with people either praising it for sticking to the original games, or criticising it for its similarity to the original games. It also saw very low retail sales, although these did not consider digital sales or copies that were sent out to Kickstarter backers. The series has also had its own animation adaption developed which premiered back in 2022. Shenmue has always been an underappreciated classic, but unfortunately, due to its niche nature and relatively low sales, I can't see the series continuing on, at least for a while. I think it's most likely on life support. Sega is always trying to one-up themselves when it comes to how absurd and ridiculous they can make their games. The game followed Ula La, a spacefaring reporter that was investigating an alien invasion. Not only did she have some of the most iconic walks in gaming history, Okay. But her method of combat was also quite unique. This game was seemingly developed with a female audience in mind, 
It's just so silly and ridiculous, but that's part of what makes the game so charming. Heck, even Michael Jackson makes a cameo appearance in this game. While the game was received well, it didn't sell too well. That wasn't going to stop Ooh La La though. And within a few years, she saw herself back at it again in Space Channel 5 Part 2. Despite pitches for a new entry on the Wii and Kinect, systems that seemingly would go hand in hand with such a game. The developers felt like they had exhausted all their ideas, and Sega, being Sega, had no interest in reviving a franchise that wasn't pulling in trillions of dollars. But no one can deny Ooh La La. And after talks between Mizuguchi, Q Entertainment and Sega, a new virtual reality project was eventually greenlit for production. Following the positive reception received on their VR demo back in 2018, the game would continue development before being unveiled as Space Channel VR. Kinda of funky newsflash, and while I've never owned a copy myself, the videos I've seen are just as goofy as the original games. Unfortunately, many critics weren't impressed with this new iteration. Honestly, it's hard to say where this game should place. I know it's had a recent release, but I can't see it having too much longevity. I think for now I will place it in the It Exists. Jetstar Radio is one of the most critically acclaimed and beloved series in gaming history. Well, at least for those who have played it. If you were to ask Sega though, I think they'd say it was one of the worst and one of the most hated series. Honestly, how this franchise hasn't got a new release after all these years is beyond me. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Jet Set Radio was first released back in 2000 as an action game for the Dreamcast. You played as a member of a graffiti gang, as you skated around Tokyo spraying graffiti, challenging rival gangs, all while avoiding the authorities. It was one of the first games to use cell shaded graphics, which still look great to this day. Like I said, this game would garner critical acclaim and is often considered one of the best games of all time. A sequel titled Jet Set Radio Future would release for the Xbox in 2002, and just like its predecessor was universally praised. So how is it that such a beloved and coveted series has yet to receive a new installment in over 20 years. Is it because the sequel didn't sell well enough? I mean maybe, but it's not like people haven't tried to revive the franchise. In fact, there have been multiple attempts trying just that, starting with Kuju Entertainment, presenting a concept to Sega regarding a new installment for the Nintendo Wii. This was shut down by Sega who stated that they weren't interested in a new installment. Fast forward to 2017 when Dinosaur Games created a visual proof of concept for a project called Jet Set Radio Evolution, which was, once again, turned down by Sega. It was it wasn't until 2021 that fans finally got something to hold on to when Sega teased the possibility of a Jet Set Radio reboot. Now this may have just been Sega screwing with fans, but some leaked footage that was apparently from Sega Japan's internal meeting held in 2021 gave rise to the real possibility of the teaser being real. I guess only time will tell if there really is a reboot in the works. For now, I'll choose to believe in this teaser and chuck the series in live support. The dawn of a new century meant the birth of a new racing game. This series in particular was meant to rival Sony's popular Gran Turismo series. Unfortunately, the games were deemed inferior and Sega GT gained the minuscule attention following its modest sales. Sega wouldn't give up hope just yet though, as they would release a sequel Sega GT 2002. Now, Sega wasn't too hopeful for this game's success, as they bundled it with Jet Set Radio Future in some cases. The last attempt at salvaging this series came in the form of Sega GT Online, which was released a year later after GT 2002, now with extra cars and an online facility to make use of Xbox's new Xbox Live functionality. Unfortunately, these games like their predecessors went relatively unnoticed and never gained much attention, essentially killing off the series before it even began. We now arrive at one of Sega's biggest franchises. Which is funny considering it's not even really theirs. What started as an innovative turn-based strategy in real-time tactics video game series, initially published by EA and Activision, believe it or not, was soon scooped up by Sega, and as a result has led to it becoming one of Sega's biggest franchises to date. The franchise I am referring to is none other than Total War a massively popular series of strategy games developed by Creative Assembly. The Total War series would make its debut appearance back in the year 2000, with its first game, Shogun Total War. Set in Japan during the Sengoku Jedi period, the game had players take on the leadership of a Japanese clan with the ultimate goal of becoming Shogun. Players were tasked with juggling a multitude of elements, including their own military force, religion, diplomacy, economics, as well as espionage, all of which had a significant impact on the player's actions, all while the battles played out in real time. These real Real-time strategies were implemented in particular to align more accurately with historical authenticity, to the point where they had real-life military historians such as Stephen Turnbull advising the creative team to make sure it was accurate. Shogun Total War was met with a positive response and sold decently well, and while it wasn't a massive breakout hit, it certainly laid the groundwork for a series that would go on to not only include 15 games, but also sell a whopping 40 million units across those games. The immense success of the series continues to this day, with the latest entry, Total War Pharaoh, scheduled for release later on into this year. 
This franchise is without a doubt a flagship franchise. And while it may not technically be a Sega one, it certainly does fill out some of the empty spaces up there. We move from one titan to another. Next up is the adorable Super Monkey Ball, a series that needs no introduction as it's consistently been released for the past 20 years. Well, consistently up to a point at least. Super Monkey Ball would actually start off as just Monkey Ball and feature three playable characters, Ai Ai, Mei Mei, and Baby, with a fourth Gong Gong being introduced in the game's Game Boy port, which added the iconic Super to the titles. These four would become the staple characters of the whole series and feature in every subsequent title to date. These games were unique in the platforming space, as instead of controlling the character themselves, players would have to guide the character who was now stuck in a gacha pond ball by tilting the board in certain directions to change the direction, gain speed, and stop. The main goal was to reach the end of each level within the time limit, without falling off the floor. Bonus points and extra lives could be earned if enough bananas had been collected on each stage. In its 20 plus year lifespan, the series has released 21 games, making it one of Sega's most prolific franchises to date. Now, to be realistic, the series has not seen a new traditional Super Monkey Ball game since Super Monkey Ball Banana Splits, which was released all the way back in 2012 for the PlayStation Vita. The games following this were either remakes of past entries or spin-off games that more so mimicked mobile games. Sales for the series as a whole are also not publicly known, with Sega not sharing the specific numbers of a lot of their older games. From what I could find, the franchise most likely has sold anywhere between 6 to 10 million copies as a whole, which while respectable, doesn't quite earn a spot in the flagship tier. I know some of you guys are going to be like, oh come on, come on guy, you're being too harsh here, but no really, like, I think Super Monkey Ball, if it had more new games coming out in the recent years instead of just like collections of past games, it could definitely be a flagship series, let's just say that. But for now, I think it's just a mainstay. Now guys, I'm going to be honest. I'm not even sure if this is a Sega franchise, but I was talking to someone that wouldn't stop going on about it, so yeah, that's why this is on the list. The Headhunting series was a pair of games that followed Jack Wade in a third-person shooter format, as he looked to re-earn his Headhunter license by taking part in virtual reality tests while catching some of the most notorious criminals in the city. The first game went on to receive fairly positive reviews, with many praising its setting and story, whereas the sequel wouldn't fare so well. The series developer, Amuse, promptly closed down following the release of the sequel, due to economic hardship in 2005. If that wasn't obvious enough, we most likely won't be getting any new Headhunter games. And here we probably have one of, if not the best manga series based on Japanese street racing, Initial D. Wait, hold on a sec, isn't this already about Sega game franchises? Well my friend, Initial D, believe it or not, actually had a few games developed for it by Sega. Well, I say a few, but it was more like an onslaught of games, 13 to be exact. 10 for arcades and 3 for home consoles. The arcade iterations were your typical races, set in the initial D universe. Each new stage or version would introduce new courses, rivals, and in some cases even new game modes like Tag Battle. The series has also seen the production of 3 home console games. The Special Stage released in 2003 for the PS2, Street Rage released as a PSP exclusive, and Initial D Extreme Stage, which was released for the PS3 in 2008. While the home console games have seemingly stopped, the arcade ones have stayed strong, with the most recent update taking place in 2021. Like many arcade games though, it's hard to place them above it exists due to their limited exposure outside of, well, actually going to arcades. But for the most part, they're a fun take on a stellar manga series that I recommend reading for anyone that's into racing. Now of course Sega would be the one to pick out such a treasured manga and anime as Astro Boy. I actually remember playing Astro Boy Omega Factor on my Game Boy years back. It was my go-to game for long road trips, and it's kind of crazy to see how well the game still holds up to this day. Omega Factor was the first Astro Boy game Sega would develop, and it was a beat-em-up in which the player took control of Astro Boy, obviously, as they fought their way through different incarnations derived from the original source. Upon meeting different NPC characters, players were rewarded with points that could be used to power up one of Astro's stats. The game even had its own fair share of hidden areas within its levels, and it honestly gave off a Pokemon feel like you were completing a Pokedex whenever you met someone new. The game would be met with critical acclaim, which convinced Sega to try the hand at one other Astro Boy game. This would take the form of a very mediocre 3D third person adventure game with small instances of an open world. Due to this iteration's poor sales and lackluster reviews, Sega parted ways with Astro Boy once again, making for a dead series.
Now here's a hidden gem, Lost to Time. The Condemned series was a set of first-person psychological thriller games that had elements of survival horror and action weaved in. The first entry, Condemned Criminal Origins, followed the story of Ethan Thomas, an agent with the FBI's serial crime unit, who had reason to believe that the surge in serial killings had something to do with the surge in vagrant assaults. What followed is a gripping and unnerving story that delves into a rabbit hole that goes far deeper than ever once thought. One aspect of Condemned that separated it from your typical first-person action games was the over-reliance on melee combat. The designers in particular looked to utilise the capabilities of the newly released Xbox 360 to bring the environment to life as well as allow for some very realistic and visceral close quarters combat. The game was met with generally positive reviews and at least by Sega's stance sold better than expected during its release week. This prompted them to develop a sequel, which was released just three years later in 2008, titled Condemned 2 Bloodshot. Set just 11 months after the original, Condemned 2 would look to fix up the problems with its predecessor, mainly the implementation of forensic tools and the lack of melee mechanics. In regard to the future of the series, Jace Hall, the co-creator of the Condemned concept, would make a post on Facebook in 2015 where he would express his desire in finding an interested proven indie development team to take over the franchise and push it forward. While this was definitely welcoming news for fans, it has hasn't seemed to work out, as 8 years later, no new developments have been mentioned. I still think there's hope though, so for now, I'm going to drop it into the zombie tier. Here we have Sega's version of Pokemon, Dinosaur King, an RPG game based on the TV series and card game of the same name. The game follows Max, Rex, and Zoe, who discover mysterious stones which allow them to summon dinosaurs. Players would be able to excavate fossils and clean them to receive dinosaurs, which they could then use to battle in the game's random encounters. Dinosaurs were categorised into different elemental types, and would grow stronger as they gained experience and leveled up. Despite it not performing too well, the game would get a spiritual successor on iOS in 2011. I would attempt to say its name, but I... yeah. Despite being a fan of anime and manga, I'd most likely butcher it. Thankfully, I don't need to read it out to know that it's a dead franchise. If I was to ask you, out of the seemingly endless Sega franchises, which ones would be at the top in terms of sales? I wonder how many would mention this next franchise. Following the Championship Manager series, Football Manager would make its debut in 2005 after Sega would acquire Sports Interactive. As I'm sure you can tell from its title, the game is a football management simulation game, where players would, well, manage their own team of players, taking care of anything from the formations, to the training, to the purchasing and learning of players. If you thought this was just like FIFA though, then I'm sorry to disappoint you, as you don't actually get to play the football. More so, it's like watching someone else play FIFA, except you can make the decisions in real time concerning the more managerial aspects of team management. Now, I'm sure some of you will think this is just an inferior series to FIFA, but just like FIFA, this series has seen a new release every single year since its inception. Not only that, but the game has consistently garnered very high ratings from critics and fans alike. The franchise has sold over 33 million units, and the series is only getting more popular with each new entry beating out the record of the previous installment. The question becomes then, is it a Sega flagship? You bet your sweet ass it is. We've now arrived at what I consider to be the best medical themed series, which is most likely just my nostalgia talking. Trauma Center was a simulation game developed by Atlas and released for the Nintendo DS in 2005. Designed to take advantage of the DS's touchscreen functionality, the game combines surgical simulation gameplay with storytelling which is delivered using non-interactive visual novel segments. I personally find the characters very charming, and the gameplay was simple but unique enough that at one point it did actually make me think, you know, maybe for the, the tiniest second of a career as a surgeon. But here I am, three lifetimes later, making mediocre videos on YouTube. <sighs> anyway, the game would sell fairly poorly in Japan, while in the West it was described by Atlas staff as absolutely fabulous, with sales going off the charts. It was around this period, however, that Atlas turned its head towards the development of Persona 3, and as a result, many of the developers that had previously worked on Trauma Center had to shift their focus. There are a few staff members left over to continue with the series, now going by the name The Kaduk Team. They would release three subsequent games, with Trauma Center New Blood for the Wii in 2007, Trauma Center Under the Knife 2 for the DS, and finally Trauma Team for the Wii in 2010. Alongside these was a remake titled Trauma Center Second Opinion, which was released for the Wii as a launch title. Now while the games had been received positively well, the game sales seemingly decreased with each release, and it seems at this point that Atlas has shelved the franchise to work on their more popular series. The little kid in me wants nothing more than to see a new game for this franchise. But if there's one series that I won't have to beg for, it's this next one. <laughs> No. 
The Yakuza or Like a Dragon franchise has quickly become one of Sega's biggest and most commercially successful franchises. The series of games incorporate elements from action adventure, beat em up and role playing games and meshes them all within an expansive open world. While each installment has its own story, they're most typically centered around a crime drama with plot lines that mimic Yakuza films. Like many other open world games, Yakuza would allow players to participate in side missions, learn new moves from NPCs, eat and drink at various restaurants, visit clubs and pretty much just do whatever the hell you one. Since its inception in 2005, the franchise has released 8 mainline games, 10 spin-offs, and multiple remasters, remakes, and compilations. Every single mainline entry in the franchise has been met with very positive reviews, and the series as a whole has sold around 20 million units. The franchise has blown up to include books, feature films, and even a TV series. This series is without a doubt one of Sega's new flagship franchises, with a new spin-off and mainline entry scheduled for release in 2024. Next up is Company of Heroes, a 2006 real-time strategy video game that evolved into its own franchise following Sega's acquisition of Relic Entertainment. Company of Heroes is set during the Second World War, which is interesting considering Sega as a company pretty much came into existence during that time period as well. The object of the game was to capture several strategic resource sectors located around the map. Players could then use these to build base structures, produce new units, and defeat their enemies. The game would go on to receive widespread acclaim, winning multiple awards and being considered by many as one of the greatest real-time strategy games ever created. Its success led to a sequel being developed called Company of Heroes 2, which also happened to be the first in the series to be published by Sega. The gameplay, while similar to the original, was modified to have players capture flagged points which would generate fuel credits that could be used to assemble more units. The sequel would once again receive positive reviews and sell incredibly well, shipping over 680,000 copies, before making its way onto Steam, where it would sell a whopping 7.4 million copies. For many, this was thought to be the final entry into the franchise, but after a decade of waiting, Sega would release a third installment titled Company of Heroes 3. Company of Heroes 3 would still be set during World War II, but featured new mechanics and modes. The series as a whole has sold over 8 million copies, making it one of Sega's biggest franchises in terms of sales. Because of its popularity, and the series even receiving its own film adaption in 2013, I'm happy to say it's a Sega mainstay. Sega more than any other company really does have their eggs just in every basket. While others seemingly have leaned more towards the home console releases, Sega would continue to mark their territory in the arcade scene with the release of Let's Go Jungle. In this joystick mounted gun arcade game, players would take on the roles of Ben and Nora as they find themselves stranded on a jungle island which thankfully is also overrun by monsters. As with most on rail shooters, the aim was simply to fire at monsters which range from mutated animals to insects. Some levels would incorporate quick time events and most would end with a boss battle. A sequel would be developed and released in 2011 called Let's Go Island. Taking place on a Pacific island this time around, the gameplay itself would remain primarily the same as its predecessor. Depending on the scores achieved by each player, the game actually had multiple endings and added a touch of replayability. Outside of that though, it's not the kind of franchise to get consistent releases and as a result is more than likely a dead one. I'd have completely forgotten about this next franchise. Full Auto was a vehicle combat racing game. I'd always likened them to the Fast and Furious movies, but honestly, these games are somehow even more believable than those films. This is the worst! Full Auto was just pure chaotic fun. The first game had four vehicle classes, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. The point of the game? Destroy as many of your opponent's vehicles as possible. I guess you could also try and race for first place, but that was that was never anyone's actual reason for playing, right? The game received average reviews, but somehow got a sequel that was released towards the end of the very same year. Full Auto 2 Battle Lines would feature much of the same as its predecessor, but in my opinion, was a weaker entry in the series. For anyone hoping that the series is coming back, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Following the closing down of Cedo Interactive in 2008, the online service no longer had a means of surviving. By July 2014, the game's online servers had completely shut down, essentially killing off the series as a whole. Starting off 2007 was Atlas, back at it again with another dungeon crawling RPG in the form of Etrian Odyssey. While it still remains one of the more niche franchises, it also happens to be one of the most consistent. The series centers around the first person exploration of dungeons, with a player created party of characters. As the series predominantly releases on DS hardware, it allows players to annotate and write notes on the map to help them navigate in case they get lost. 
Over its lifespan, the franchise has seen the release of 11 games, including two remakes, two spin-offs, and most recently, an Origins collection that remastered the first three games and released them together for the Nintendo Switch in 2023. In total, the series has sold over 1.5 million copies, which by most standards isn't mind-blowing. So despite its consistent releases, I can't put it any higher than it exists due to its niche nature and humble sales. And finishing off 2007 was Sega, with another light gun rail shooter called Ghost Squad. Immersion was the name of the game with this one, as Sega wanted to make sure the game felt as realistic as possible. The arcade gun featured a working fire selector switch, a stock, force feedback recoil, and cold hard iron sights. The game itself featured three non-linear levels that featured branching tactical decisions, as well as numerous sub-activities like defusing bombs and throwing grenades to disable armor. A home console version was developed for the Nintendo Wii and released a few years later in 2007. The game, while receiving fairly average reviews, did manage to snag itself a sequel with Operation Ghost in 2012. Even so, these types of franchises are never consistent, and for that reason, I don't think it can go any higher than maybe the zombie tier. Now if you haven't had the chance to play the series, then treat yourself and give it a shot. Valkyrie Chronicles is one of the best tactical RPG games I've had the chance to experience. While the games still incorporate turn-based combat, it does so in its own unique Blitz format, which shows the battles in live tactical zones. It introduced a more hands-on approach, where instead of just moving and commanding troops to perform actions, you as the player got to manually aim and take the shot yourself. It added that bit of oomph into the gameplay, and to this day, I think may be one of the few to incorporate such a unique aspect. Funnily enough, the game takes place in Europa, a fictional continent based on Europe during the onset of, you guessed it, World War II. I'm not sure if Sega likes paying homage to their creation, but this sort of focus in their games makes me think twice. The original Valkyrie Chronicles would garner critical acclaim, winning multiple awards for the time, with many believing it to be one of the best tactical RPG games ever. It would mark the beginning of a media franchise that not only has resulted in three mainline sequels and a spin-off, but has branched out to include its very own manga and anime. Over its 15-year lifespan, the series has seen considerable success, with its most recent entry, Valkyrie Chronicles 4, passing 1 million total sales. Now as much as I'd love to place it in the mainstay status, I think due to its smaller player base, I have to put it in It Exists. Actually, you know what, screw it. It's going in mainstays, it's consistent, and has had several entries over its short lifespan. I don't care what anyone else has to say, you can roast me in the comments. Now, if you thought Mario and Sonic had the best Olympic-themed games, then you, I mean, you're right. But alongside the partnership with Nintendo, Sega would also get the rights to publish the official Olympics games, starting with Beijing 2008. Beijing 2008, in particular, would be the first time an Olympic video game would feature an online mode, and while a cool addition, it would certainly help if the games were a bit better. They're, like, they're all right at best, mediocre at worst, with each new iteration featuring more national teams, yet somehow fewer events? Like, what's up with that? Regardless, because it's the Olympics, we can expect further entries into the series in the near future, and while there's no way it could ever appear as a mainstay, it certainly isn't a dying franchise. Also, just quickly speaking about Mario & Sonic Olympic Games, I already covered them in my Nintendo franchise video, and in the same vein with the Bayonetta series, I've also covered that in the Nintendo video, so I won't be ranking those ones again this time. Now let me ask you guys something, Captain America or Iron Man? Alright, now that we've established that Iron Man is cooler, let's talk about how fucking trash his games were. Now Sega's no stranger to using household names for from films in their games, and the unfortunate sacrifice this time around was Marvel's Iron Man. Now while the original game was released back in 2008, and actually had Robert Downey Jr, Terrence Howard, and Sean Torb reprising their roles from the movie, the actual games themselves were just lackluster to put it nicely. Despite the game being like a 3 hours max, and the controls suck an ass, it's still, god like, what is this camera? I didn't even know what I'm looking at. Oh sorry, I got sidetracked. But regardless, because it's Iron Man, the game sold incredibly well. It sold so well that GameSpot awarded it the coveted award, the worst game that everyone played. And against all odds, Iron Man 2 was somehow worse than the original. And maybe that's a hot take, but Iron Man 2 had repetitive gameplay, lack of enemy design, game length was still shorter than my... Yeah. Overall, this was a series based on the films. It's safe to say for Sega that this is a dead franchise. Now this next franchise would start as a Japanese exclusive, but due to its growing popularity, finally made its way over to the West with its latest entry. The series in question is the 7th Dragon franchise, which was first released back in 2009 for the Nintendo DS. 
The game is a cutesy RPG game, taking place in the world of Eden, 80% of which is ruled by various reptiles who are led by seven dragons, hence the title. Seventh Dragon incorporates character classes as well as an extensive overworld that players could explore before taking part in battles. Now while the original game did receive fan translations, which allowed English players to enjoy the games, it wasn't until three sequels later with Seventh Dragon 3, code VFD, that the game would officially receive a Western release back in 2016. This game would mark the final installment in the Seventh Dragon franchise, with the story being tied up following it. Now despite my saying that, it doesn't mean that this is the end of the franchise as a whole. Game director Kazuya Ninoi has mentioned his desire to continue with the series, with a remake of the first game along with a new sequel. This was back in 2019 however, so only time will tell. For now, it's safe to say that the game is, it's, 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 it's branching into life support, with a good chance of coming back. Wait, now just hang on a second. Isn't Angry Birds owned by Rovio Entertainment? Yeah, okay. For those of you that aren't aware, Sega is currently in the process of acquiring Rovio Entertainment for a lot of money. Yeah, which means they'd get access to Angry Birds, you know, Small Town Murders, what else do they have? Sugar Blast. I'm not going to include it in this video as the deal hasn't actually gone through yet. They're still just considering it and talking it through. But I thought I'd just mention it because, you know, people probably bring it up. I'm sure everyone can guess where it would end up anyway. Sega would find themselves back in the home console market after picking up high voltage software's The Conduit, a first person shooter developed for the Wii and Android. While I've never played the game myself, its gameplay did remind me of the Metroid Prime games, and more specifically Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, due to its similar control scheme on the Wii. The story focuses on a species of aliens called the Drudge as they invade Washington DC. It's up to the players, in control of the newly inducted agent Michael Ford, to clear up and stop the destruction of the capital. The game actually featured its own multiplayer mode, and it even had its own voice chat implementation through Wii Speak. Unfortunately, this was only available between those who would exchange friend codes, so no Modern Warfare 2 shenanigans were happening this time around. For the most part, this game was received well and sold decently well, shipping over 350,000 copies during its lifetime. After months of speculation, a sequel for the series would release in 2010. Unfortunately though, this new entry was met with a very lukewarm reception. It did not meet sales expectations. So despite the game ending on a cliffhanger, it's very unlikely to continue, given the fact that High Voltage Software has not even mentioned the development of a third conduit game. Sega's next franchise would be Kingdom Conquest, an MMO strategy game that incorporated card collection and third person action. This was a free to download game for iOS and Android, but of course, if you aren't buying any of their $40 packages, you're most likely not going anywhere. The game actually got itself into some controversy, with people saying that despite the game itself being free to play and download, it was somehow drawing out funds from players' iTunes accounts. It was such a big problem that even players who had never downloaded the game in the first place somehow were getting money stolen from them, which I don't even know how that's possible. I guess everyone forgot after a few days though, because just two days later, a sequel called Kingdom Conquest 2 would release, which pretty much was the same game, just with 2 in the title. The game ended its services in 2017, and while another sequel called Kingdom Conquest Dark Empire would launch in its place, I don't believe it's owned by Sega anymore, meaning that it's most likely a dead franchise. Sega had developed a game for pretty much every genre under the sun by this point, and for those saying, oh they haven't tackled 4x strategy games yet, well, Sega would release Endless Space, their very own 4x turn-based strategy game. In a similar fashion to the immensely popular Civilization series, except this time set in 3000 AD, players would command one of 12 unique civilizations, as they created their own interstellar empire and conquered the galaxy. Endless Space would receive positive reviews, resulting in it winning the Unity Golden Cube award in 2013. Due to the game's commercial success, where it sold over 1 million copies, Sega would release two spin-off games, as well as a direct sequel titled Endless Space 2 in 2017. The series will also see a new installment with Endless Dungeon towards the end of this year. As a whole, the the franchise is actually fairly recent, and has seen its fair share of games released. I could definitely see it becoming a Sega mainstay before long, and some of you may even consider it one already, based on its consistency and positive reception. At the moment, I would probably say it's in the it exists category though. Now while you may have not heard of this next franchise, you've most likely seen someone going crazy at the arcade playing it. I'm talking about Mai Mai a rhythm game series where players interact with objects on a touchscreen and execute dance-like moves. It's become notorious for its striking resemblance to a front loader washing machine. And that's not even me saying that. Even advertisements promoting it would throw in jokes saying things like, it's not a washing machine. Which I mean, I'm glad they cleared that up because, well, I mean it really does look like a washing machine. As is the case with arcade machines, the Mai Mai franchise has seen plenty of updated machines to this day. But due to its niche nature and being an arcade exclusive, I can't put it any higher than it exists. 
Chain Chronicle was a unique take on a tower defense role playing game. The gameplay was split up into three separate elements, tower defense, traditional RPG elements, as well as card trading in the form of arcanas. Players were able to play through the game as an RPG, visiting towns and participating in events, but while the story was driven by RPG elements, its combat would focus on tower defense elements instead. Despite the game releasing in Japan initially, the positive reception it received allowed for it to be licensed outside of Japan and even got a western release in 2014. Unfortunately, the game was closed down in North America in February of 2016, and its sequel which was released in March of 2022 in Japan also had its service shut down on May 31st, 2023 due to its waning interest and in-game purchases. While it's a strange addition to the list, it's without a doubt a dead one. Now as they've done in the past, Sega would partner with a small film series, this time going by the name of Transformers. Sega would actually release the first arcade video game based on this franchise with the release of Transformers Human Alliance in 2013. This rail shooter was actually the spiritual successor of the Let's Go Jungle series, and was set in the Transformers universe and also includes multiple stages over different countries. And while it may not follow the film series to a T, it does feature fan favourites like Starscream. And yes, I don't care what anyone says, Starscream was cool, alright? even if he didn't get to do much before being absolutely bodied. Sega would release a follow-up to Human Alliance with Transformers Shadows Rising in 2018. The game which pretty much played the exact same as its predecessor, had a new set of stages that could be played in any order before unlocking the final stage, the moon. It's always hard to rank arcade games, seeing as they kind of just get released whenever. Based on the fact that it only has two iterations, I'm going to say that it's most likely on life support, until, well I guess the Transformer movie just came out, so maybe a new one's coming out soon. Chun Nitham is an arcade rhythm game and the latest one to be released worldwide by Sega. It has the player use touch and motion based sensor bars to input commands that correspond to notes scrolling down the screen. As with any music rhythm game, there are plenty of different actions such as tapping, holding, sliding and waving their hands in the air. Now while there isn't too much information regarding the success of the cabinets, they have continued to produce new models up until May of 2023. This consistency at least in my opinion allows them a slot in the it exists here, regardless of how niche the franchise is. And there we have it. Sega, more so than any other company that we've covered, loves to pump out franchises. In doing so, they have ushered in some of the biggest innovations in the gaming space, often being first to incorporate groundbreaking ideas that are still being implemented in games to this day. Unfortunately, it seems that while they love being first to do things, they will most likely never be the ones to have the last laugh, as many of their once innovative and cherished franchises are now nothing more than distant memories, relics, lost to time. If you guys enjoyed this two-part series, please do subscribe. These videos take an incredible amount of time and effort to create, so any support is very much appreciated. Once again, I'm sorry for having to split the video up in two, but yeah, my computer was on the brink of collapse. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next one. Oh, shout out to my channel members. I love you guys extra.